In April 2025, a convoy of marine vehicles rolled onto Bataan Island in the Philippines, just about 120 miles from Taiwan. What they carried would make Chinese military planners lose sleep. The Pentagon calls it Nemesis. The Marines call it a ship-killing coastal defense system. But what matters most is where it's pointing, directly at one of the most strategically important 155 miles of water on Earth, the Luzon Strait, with the Bashi Channel narrowing to around 80 miles, China's gateway to the Pacific. Here's why this matters right now. China's Navy is the largest in the world by number of ships. Their anti-ship ballistic missiles, the DF-21D and DF-26, have ranges up to about 1,500 kilometers and up to around 4,000 kilometers, respectively. They've built artificial islands bristling with radar and air defense systems across the South China Sea, and their strategy is simple. Push American carriers so far back they can't help Taiwan if conflict breaks out. But there's a problem with that plan. The Marines just deployed something that turns China's entire naval strategy on its head. A weapon system so mobile it can vanish into jungle terrain within minutes, so lethal it can strike targets up to 115 miles away, and so clever in its design that tele-operated launchers let Marines fire from standoff positions. This is the story of how 400-kilogram missiles mounted on robotic trucks became America's answer to a naval superpower, how a Norwegian missile design became the centerpiece of Pacific deterrence and why the next war in the Pacific might be won or lost, not by aircraft carriers, but by ghost launchers hiding in island chains. Welcome to the future of coastal warfare. Let's rewind to November 26, 2024. Marine Corps Base Hawaii, a ceremony most Americans never heard about. The 3rd Marine Littoral Regiment formally received Nemesis, the Navy Marine Expeditionary Ship Interdiction System. It sounds bureaucratic. It's anything but because hidden in that handoff was a fundamental shift in how America plans to fight in the Pacific. For decades, the Navy's strategy was simple. Park aircraft carriers off enemy coasts and project power. Carriers are floating cities, roughly 11 acres of sovereign American territory, with about 75 aircraft and around 5,000 sailors and Marines. They're intimidating. They're powerful. They're also increasingly vulnerable. China has spent 20 years developing what Pentagon analysts call carrier killer missiles. The DF-21D has a range of around 1,500 kilometers. The DF-26, up to around 4,000 kilometers, with a maritime strike variant. That means Chinese missiles can theoretically reach targets from their mainland out to Guam and beyond. The math is brutal. A multi-billion dollar aircraft carrier faces a roughly $2 million class anti-ship missile. Cost exchange favors the attacker, though survivability and salvo defenses still matter. So here's the mystery. How do you counter an adversary that can keep your most powerful assets at bay? How do you defend island chains when your traditional naval dominance is being challenged? How do you cover the Luzon Strait, approximately 155 miles wide, narrowing to around 80 miles in the Bashi Channel, when sending in a carrier strike group might trigger the exact crisis you're trying to prevent? The answer arrived on the back of a remotely operated vehicle that looks like a souped-up pickup truck. But here's what makes this story fascinating. Nemesis isn't just another weapon system. It represents three converging ideas that are reshaping American military strategy. First, distributed lethality. Instead of concentrating firepower on big, expensive platforms, spread it across dozens of small, cheap, hard-to-find launchers. Second, the return of coastal defense. For the first time in the modern era, U.S. forces are fielding a land-based anti-ship missile force at scale. Third, allied integration. These systems aren't just American. They're being deployed to the Philippines during exercises, coordinated with Japanese forces, and designed to work in concert with allied navies. And China? They're watching every move. Because Nemesis' deployment to the Luzon Strait in April 2025 wasn't just an exercise. It was a message written in missile launchers. To understand why Nemesis matters, you need to understand what it replaced, or more accurately, what nothing replaced. Until 2021, the U.S. Marine Corps had exactly zero ground-based anti-ship missiles. Zero. If you wanted to hit an enemy ship from land, you called in naval gunfire or airstrikes, but you couldn't do it yourself. That's a problem when your new mission is island-hopping warfare in the Pacific. The roots go back to 2019 and a document called Force Design 2030. Marine Commandant General David Berger looked at the future battlefield and made a radical decision. Transform the entire Marine Corps. Get rid of tanks, shrink the force, cut heavy artillery, and invest everything in being light, mobile, and lethal in literal environments. The shallow coastal waters where America's next fight would likely happen. The concept? Marine littoral regiments. Small, distributed units that could operate from remote islands 
denying sea space to enemy navies, stand-in forces that would already be in position when conflict started, rather than sailing in weeks later. But they needed weapons to make that concept work. Enter Norway. The naval strike missile was developed by Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace in the early 2000s. It's subsonic, not hypersonic, which sounds unimpressive until you understand the genius of its design. The missile flies at sea-skimming altitude, meters above the waves. It uses terrain masking. It can perform evasive maneuvers. It has an imaging infrared seeker that doesn't emit radio frequency energy, meaning it approaches targets passively. Think of it like this. Most anti-ship missiles are sprinters shouting as they run. The NSM is a silent assassin that hugs shadows. The US Navy was already buying NSMS for its literal combat ships. The Marines looked at the same missile and asked a different question. What if we put this on a truck, not just any truck? The Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, the JLTV, which replaced the old Humvee. But here's the clever part. Make it unmanned and tele-operated. Mount two missiles in their sealed canisters on top. Add autonomy upgrades now being fielded. Suddenly you have a weapon system that can drive itself to firing positions. Launch missiles at ships over the horizon and relocate before enemy counterfire arrives. Minimal Marines at risk. Crews control the launcher from standoff positions rather than sitting in the vehicle. And it works. August 2021. Pacific Missile Range Facility, Hawaii. A decommissioned Navy vessel sits at anchor over 100 nautical miles offshore. Nemesis fires for the first time in combat conditions. The Naval Strike Missile screams off the launcher at subsonic speed, around 600 miles per hour. It immediately drops to wave top altitude. Onboard GPS and inertial guidance keep it on course. As it approaches the target area, terrain following profiles and that passive infrared seeker take over. The missile doesn't announce itself. No active radar emissions, just a heat-seeking camera looking for the thermal signature of a ship. The former Navy vessel never stood a chance. Direct hit. The Pentagon loved it. But that was just layer one. Layer two came in the targeting revolution. See, hitting a stationary ship 100 miles away is impressive. Hitting a moving ship is exponentially harder. You need real-time intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance data. You need to know where that ship is now and where it will be when your missile arrives. Nemesis integrates with the Marine Air Ground Task Force's Fire Support Coordination Centers. It plugs into joint and allied targeting networks that queue coastal fires. Specific sensor links are classified or not fully public. The Marines operating Nemesis aren't just launching missiles. They're nodes in a kill chain across the theater. But here's where it gets better. And this is Layer 3. Remember I said these vehicles are unmanned and teleoperated? In January 2025, the Marine Corps awarded a contract to add auto drive autonomy from Forterra, bringing convoying and waypoint navigation to the JLTV-based launcher. Now picture this tactical scenario. You're a Marine fire support team on a remote island in Batanis. You've got six Nemesis launchers scattered across difficult terrain, jungle, volcanic rock, narrow coastal roads. Enemy reconnaissance drones are searching for you. Satellites are passing overhead every 90 minutes. You don't drive those launchers manually. You program waypoints. The vehicles navigate themselves to pre-selected firing positions. They can follow each other in convoy. They can disperse automatically when threat indicators spike. When the firing order comes, you're not sitting in the vehicle. You're in a command center miles away, maybe on a different island entirely, coordinating the shot with naval and air assets. The launcher drives itself into position, stabilizes, fires, and immediately relocates to a pre-programmed hide site before enemy counterfire can triangulate the launch point. This is what military analysts call distributed lethality taken to its logical conclusion. But wait, it gets even more strategic. By April 2025, Nemesis deployment to the Philippines represented something unprecedented. This was the closest U.S. land-based anti-ship missiles had ever been positioned to mainland China. The Luzon Strait is roughly 155 miles wide overall, with the Bashi Channel at around 80 miles. Do the math. Nemesis with naval strike missiles has a range of about 115 miles. In theory, if launchers are positioned on the northern islands of Batans and other key terrain along the first island chain, you've effectively created a missile engagement zone covering much of the strait. Why does that matter? The Luzon Strait is the only deep water conduit between the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean, a primary route for submarines. Chinese nuclear submarines based in Hainan Island prefer to transit through here to reach patrol areas in the Pacific. Surface action groups moving to reinforce positions in the South China Sea use this corridor. It's a strategic choke point, and now it's covered by anti-ship missiles that are designed to be hard to detect and target, thanks to mobile launchers and passive-seeking missiles. During Balikatan 2025, 
the massive joint exercise with the Philippines, Marines used C-130 transport aircraft to airlift Nemesis launchers to multiple islands in Batanes. They practiced maritime key terrain security operations. Translation. They rehearsed locking down the strait. The Marines didn't fire live missiles during the exercise. They didn't have to. The message was clear. China's response? Predictably furious public statements about provocative actions and destabilizing deployments. Privately, Chinese military planners are recalculating their operational plans because Nemesis just added an entirely new variable to their Taiwan contingency scenarios. Let's talk about what this means for the strategic chessboard. The Marine Corps plans to field on the order of approximately 250 to 260 Nemesis launchers by 2030, organized into a reported 14 batteries, about 18 launchers each, with multiple batteries aligned to Marine littoral regiments in the Pacific and other supporting rotational deployments. But the implications go way beyond the hardware. First, Allied confidence. The Philippines asked for and hosted Nemesis during Balakatan 2025. Japan is integrating its own Type 12 surface to ship missiles with U.S. systems during bilateral exercises. Australia is watching closely. They're evaluating their own land-based maritime strike options. What America is building is called the First Island Chain Defense Architecture. Picture a chain of allied territories from Japan through Taiwan to the Philippines, all equipped with overlapping anti-ship missile coverage. It's not a wall. It's a weapons engagement zone that makes Chinese naval operations incredibly costly. Second, the carrier equation changes. Critics have declared aircraft carriers obsolete for years. They're wrong, but they're also not entirely wrong. Carriers remain essential for power projection. But they're no longer the only way to establish sea control in contested littoral environments. Nemesis gives you sea denial at a fraction of the cost. A single NSM, roughly a $2 million class weapon, can threaten multi-billion dollar warships, a stark cost exchange that favors the defender. Third, China is adapting. They're not sitting still. Reports from late 2024 show the People's Liberation Army developing electronic warfare capabilities specifically targeting U.S. missile systems. They're improving their satellite reconnaissance to detect and track mobile launchers. They're investing in longer-range anti-ship missiles of their own. This is an arms race in slow motion. But here's the thing about arms races. They favor the side with better allies, better technology integration, and better operational concepts. The United States has treaty allies spanning the Pacific. We conduct dozens of joint exercises annually. Our systems are designed for interoperability. China, they conduct exercises mostly alone. Their partnerships are transactional, not based on decades of shared defense commitments. And that brings us to the most important consequence, deterrence. Nemesis isn't designed to win World War III. It's designed to prevent World War III from starting. So where does this go next? The immediate future is expansion. More Nemesis batteries activating through 2025 to 2026. The 12th Marine Littoral Regiment in Okinawa began Nemesis training in July 2025, with its first battery expected in fiscal year 26. Training has expanded across the Southwest Islands. Exercise Commandog 9 in late 2025 is planned to see Nemesis return to Batanis, integrated with Army HIMARS systems and the Marines' new air defense capabilities. They're building a comprehensive anti-access area denial network, land-based missiles that can engage ships, aircraft, and even ballistic missiles. The technology is evolving too. The Naval Strike Missile has a land attack variant. Future versions of Nemesis might engage coastal targets, command centers, radar sites, the same platform, multiple mission sets. But the biggest question isn't technological, it's strategic. Can distributed networks of small mobile systems really counter a naval superpower? Can launchers hiding in island jungles deter a fleet of destroyers and carriers? History suggests yes. Small, dispersed, hard-to-find weapons have always been force multipliers. From German U-boats in World War II to insurgent IEDs in Iraq, the pattern holds. Concentrated power is vulnerable. Distributed lethality is resilient. The unresolved question is this. What happens during the first real crisis? When Chinese and American forces are maneuvering in the same waters, will Nemesis presence escalate tensions or diffuse them? Will the threat of these hidden launchers convince Chinese planners that the costs outweigh the benefits? Or will it trigger the exact conflict everyone wants to avoid? We don't know yet. What we do know is this. The Pacific is no longer just about aircraft carriers and surface action groups. The future of naval warfare is being written on remote islands by Marines operating robotic trucks carrying Norwegian missiles. And China is taking notes. Remember that convoy that rolled onto Bataan Island in April 2025? 
Those launchers rotated through Bataan in 2025, and the message remains, deterring. If this deep dive into Nemesis and Pacific strategy opened your eyes to the real chess game happening across the ocean, hit subscribe. We're tracking every deployment, every exercise, every technological leap in the new era of distributed warfare. The Pentagon doesn't advertise these systems, but they're part of why you sleep safely tonight. Next video, we're providing an update on the Typhon missile system. Nemesis's big brother with a range that reaches well over 1,000 kilometers into mainland China. The weapon Beijing fears most. See you there.